So with that, you know, please join me with uh, welcoming our good friend and close partner, Marcus Limonis. Thank you, buddy. Thanks, Thank you. Okay. Before we get started, for those people watching at home, we are also broadcasting on the biggest screen in Times Square, so everybody in Times Square can see what we're doing. Go on to your Facebook page. Go on to Facebook. Go to T-Mobile at work and share this live broadcast for other people that you know that are interested in learning more about their business, whether they work there or they own the place. So please go on. We'll be taking questions not only from people live in Times Square, but we'll also be taking questions from people around the country, but you have to post your question on the feed. So you'll see the live feed that's going on now. You have to post your question on the feed, and we'll grab them. We're gonna be here for as long as we want. I know that T-Mobile said a half hour, but tonight I'm 100% in charge. So <laughs> we're going to, until they pull the plug. Uh, look, um, I'm excited to be here because this is the week that small business gets the biggest spotlight. In this country, in my opinion, small business is the backbone of what happens in America. But I have one question. Why are we only celebrating it one time a year? You're giving us one week. As small business owners, we employ 94% of this country. We have our blood, our sweat, our tears, our credit cards, our second mortgages, all tied up in small businesses. As a small business owner, along with all of you, I'm here to send the message to the American community. We don't need your pity, we need your support. We are small business owners, we expect to have a high standard, we expect to deliver you the best product for the best price with the best service. We want you to do business with us because we've earned the right to have your business not because we need you to give us your business. As small business owners, we know we have to get better at a lot of things. We have to get better at our systems. We have to get better at our accounting. We have to get better at our marketing. By the way, so does every other business in America, not just small business. One thing small business owners know more than anything else is the importance of the customer. While we relish our employees more than anything else, we know that the customer is really the key to our success. They're the ones that can use technology to spread the word, both good and bad. They're the ones that can give us feedback on how to improve our business. And they vote for us with their wallet. The key for us as small business owners is to engage with customers. Using social media, using in-store activation, using product demonstration to get feedback on how we can get better. But in order to do that, we have to be willing to take that feedback. It may hurt our feelings, that's okay. But we have to take that feedback and actually make it actionable. Do something with it so that the customer believes and sees that their feedback matters. Worst thing you can do is ask somebody for their feedback and do nothing with it. Can't get offended by them, can't argue with them, too often I see small businesses go onto their social media, a potential customer or a current customer posts a comment on their page about a bad experience or something they didn't like, and instead of trying to come up with a dispute resolution, solving the problem as quickly as we can, we start arguing with them. I went to the restaurant, the food wasn't hot. Oh, it was hot, you just didn't know it. We start saying things that are silly. I stayed in the motel and the place wasn't clean. Well, maybe yours wasn't clean, but everybody else's was clean. So we have to learn to take that feedback in a constructive way. We have to see that the consumer is there as our focus group. They're there as our advocate. Americans, in my opinion, want nothing more than for small businesses to succeed. It doesn't mean they're gonna give us a hall pass. It doesn't mean they're gonna let us off the hook when we need to do things the right way. And our job, is to raise the level of service as small business owners, therefore requiring medium and large businesses to have to raise their service just the same, ultimately creating a better experience for consumers. As small business owners, we also have to be mindful that vulnerability, and what I mean by that is transparency and vulnerability are the key to unlocking the customer. 
the closer we are to that customer, the closer our relationship is with them, the more we share with them about the, the successes and the failures of our business, the more people want to rally around us. People don't want to rally around know-it-alls. And they don't want to, they don't want to rally around show-offs. They want to rally around people they can relate to. By the way, I'm not telling you that that's so unique to business. As human beings, that's how we function. We want to hang out with people that we feel we're equal to, which means we all make mistakes. I make them every day. We all have failures. I've had plenty of them. It's what we learn from those failures that matter. So as we go through tonight, this is really about understanding what questions to ask that are going to make us smarter in dealing with our consumers. Remember, they vote with their checkbook. They may not always tell you to your face what they think, but if they don't show up and they're not engaged, they're telling you what they think. Okay? So we're going to open up the floor for questions. Um, it's important to me that we have a mixture of questions in the room and of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that are watching us live from Times Square as we celebrate Small Business Week. So we're going to start with questions in the room. Is that okay? And obviously, I was raised right, so we're going to start with ladies first. Okay? <laughs> Who's the first brave victim in the room? Ma'am, I think you have a question. Your friend was nudging you and telling you to ask. What is your question? Stand up. We're going to give you a microphone. Stand up, Lauren. Look at the crowd, please. Hello, everybody. So from your show, I can tell that you are an expert in operations. So in scaling a company, what is something that you would recommend operationally, either from the employee standpoint or anything else in trying to do that successfully without taking on, without risking customer service? So Lauren, I would not describe myself <clears throat> as an expert in operations. I would uh, describe myself as a student of good operations. And I spend a lot of time watching what people do right and do wrong, and I try to share that. But it's really about the business owner running their business, not me running it for them. My, my first response or my first reaction to people looking to scale their business is that bigger is not always better. More is not always going to result in more profitability. The reality of it is, is that more can often result in less profitability. In fact, if we look across the American landscape, we're seeing more bankruptcies in retail and in services than we've seen in recent years. Every company thought that the thing to do was to go as fast as they possibly could to generate revenue. I'm here to tell you that you should not care about revenue. You should care about profitability. You should care about the consumer experience. And most importantly, you should care about the employee experience. Now, I don't give myself an A in that regard. I feel like I'm always trying to get better. I'd give myself a B minus. I'm learning. Things change. I have to get better. But I think in order for you to scale, you have to ask yourself a few principal questions. What's the reason you want to scale? Are you scaling because you want to spread yourself thin? Are you scaling because you believe that that's what a potential buyer would want to see? Are you scaling yourself because you feel that the solution that you have that you're solving, the problem you're solving in your market, is not being solved by somebody else in their market? And if you are the driving force behind your business, who is going to be you in that next market? Sometimes really perfecting your model, knowing your top line, knowing your margins, understanding if you're maximizing profitability, maximizing customer experience, should be what you should spend most of your time on. If you've decided that you want to grow, you want to look at a market that looks like it has the highest rate of success. So if your business is in New York City, I don't think you want to next go to Hong Kong. Right? It's far. It's intimidating. Maybe you try a smaller market in New York or in New Jersey or in a surrounding area where you can have your finger on the pulse. Because ultimately, in that scaling, the customer experience is going to change. The consumer's different, your staff's different, and you're not there. So that's a big mistake. So I would just tell you, everybody that thinks scaling is important, just slow it down for a minute. OK? Next question. Yes, ma'am. What is the best way for a business, what is the best way for a business in, a, in its infancy 
to build credibility and trust in the marketplace. What is the best way for a business in its infancy to build credibility and trust? It's to get a referral program and a validation program and a third party endorsement program from your customers. Testimonials through social media, through whatever source you can, even your own social media pages using technology, or letters of recommendation, or pictures with them in your business are the best way to gain credibility because ultimately people will buy from other people will buy from you if they know that other people have had a good experience. Everybody in the room knows when we go to a restaurant, we're with our, our date or our significant other and we're getting ready to go out to eat, they recommend a restaurant, what do most of us do? We go on to Yelp and we look at how other people rate our business. Oh, they said the service was slow. Oh, somebody said the food was cold. What do we do? Typically, we don't go. So a business in its infancy has very few chances to make that impression. We have to be aware of the experience, we have to solve the problem, and we have to create an army of people who, in my opinion, are gonna be your ambassadors. None of us in the room, other than T-Mobile and Disney and other big companies, can afford, right out of the gates, to have a business and advertise in Times Square. It's expensive. So we have to think about what our version of Times Square is. It could be a small town where you're uh, activating with your local community, doing engagement. It could be social media that you're doing videos and experiential things. But we have to create our own Times Square and build an army of ambassadors. If the referrals are bad or the testimonials are bad, I, I don't know how long you'll be around. Unless you fix them. Next question. Yes, sir. My question is, uh, in, in, in starting out a new business, when do you know when it's time to either change or even abandon your business model? Maybe it's not working. At what stage do you say to yourself, okay, I need to make a change? Uh, every day you wake up, you should be thinking about changing. There's been a lot of successful brands in the history of our country. Um, unfortunately, a lot of them don't exist anymore because they got rooted in a business philosophy and in a process that didn't evolve before the customer evolved, that didn't evolve before the new company evolved. If you're in the technology business, then it's every five minutes. If you're in the services or retail business, it's literally every day. You have to assume that your competitor is always in front of you and that the way you deliver your service or product or the way you deliver um, your messaging has to constantly evolve because with, with information today and consumers' ability to get information from so many different places, they're bombarded with stuff and their ideas are spinning in their head and if you're not spinning with them, they're gonna be left behind. So my response is you don't wait till you fail or lose money or run out of money in your bank account. You should do it while things are good. And I'm hoping that we're sending some Facebook questions in. Do we, I know that we're doing that. We're going to give it a few minutes, and then we're going to take a few. A few more in here. This is the shy crowd. Yes, sir. How are you? Yeah, I just want to remind everybody, can we get some noise? We're in Times Square. <laughs> I mean, man, get excited. There's like a million people outside. How can, you, uh, how can small businesses adapt to the digital kind of transformation that's taking place in retail and the way that consumers kind of buy product? I see that as an advantage for small business because they're able to um, do some very targeted marketing, maybe look at some new ideas, get to their customers in a more unique way, and it's not, it's not very expensive. How do small businesses start to navigate that and get into that kind of digital selling, social selling opportunity without, beyond just having a Facebook page, really leveraging the platforms? I, uh, this is actually a very important uh, point that I want to make. We're hearing a lot today about the Amazon effect and its annihilation of the retail market. I'm here to tell you that Amazon is not going to annihilate the retail market. We as retailers or service providers are going to annihilate ourselves if we don't win the game by having the lowest cost structure. This is not a marketing game or a margin game exclusively. This is a SG&A managing your expenses game. 
Here's a good example. Uh, I bought a business last week out of bankruptcy. It was a pretty big chain, did a billion dollars in business, lost $20 million a year. Now, you have to really have your mind blown to think that a company can do a billion dollars in business and lose money. Well, we laugh at that. But on a proportionate basis as small business owners, we may do a million dollars of business and lose 20,000. It doesn't sound as extreme, but on a percentage basis, it's not that far off, right? The key in my mind is how do we get back to running our business with the thinnest of costs? That doesn't mean you compromise your team or the labor pool, but how do we get back to not having expensive rents, not having fancy travel, not overstaffing or having luxuries. When is it that we as business owners get back to running our business like they used to, with the bare essentials focused on our employees and focused on our customers? We don't need fancy offices or fancy company vehicles or big splashy marketing campaigns. We need to get down to basics because at the end of the day, we're delivering a commodity. And that commodity will be all driven by the market price that the consumer wants to pay. So you sell an Apple for a dollar and Amazon sells it for 98 cents, as an example. The consumer's not going to choose Amazon all the time because of the two pennies. They may, but in some cases they want it right now or they want it tomorrow, or you have a rapport with them and they'll pay you a very, very, very small premium because of the relationship. Where you will not win is if your cost structure doesn't allow you to be profitable at selling it at those types of margins. Too often companies are taking on big rents with big inventories, with big marketing budgets, with big corporate staffs where it sounds like a bank where there's 19 vice presidents. We laugh, but it happens. In order for small business to make it through this digital age, separate from having to have a very active social media campaign, separate from having to have a relevant product, separate from having a good delivery process or experience, separate from having well-trained employees, your cost structure has to be such that you can survive on today's digital margins. So for everybody in this room that's struggling to make money, I want you to go back tomorrow, just tomorrow, and not look at your top line for a minute. Not look at your marketing content. Look at your cost structure. Start from yourself to all the way where the product or service are delivered and find out what are all the things that I spend to deliver that experience and really ask yourself, do you need it all? Everybody in this room, I could cut $5,000 out of your business in 10 minutes. But you need to do it. Okay? Does that help? Next question. Yeah, let's take a Facebook yeah, so one. David wants to know, should businesses delete negative feedback off their social media pages? No. Um, in no circumstance should anybody be deleting negative feedback from their social media pages unless it is slanderous, it is attacking another employee, it is criticizing a competitor. We don't want to be in the business of of making ourselves look good because our competitors are being made to look bad. That is not the business we want to be in, right? We don't want to have politics or religion or things that are unrelated to the business. But if you deliver a product or service and you did a bad job, you should be punished for it. Yes, that's how I look at it. You should be punished. But the way to recover from that is to solve that problem as fast as it's posted. Oftentimes, if you solve that problem for the consumer, they will either reply back and tell everybody the story, or in some cases, they may even delete the negative post because maybe their emotions got the best of them, and then you solved it, and they were like, oh, man, I'm really sorry I said that. I'm going to take it down. But do not ask them to take it down. We don't want to be in the business of editorializing people's perspectives. Because if you go on to any business and there's nothing negative, I think it's fantasy land. Like, nobody has that. So let your, let your true colors show, but also show how you can solve situations. Let's take one more from... Yeah, so Stacy wants to know, are the customers always right? Um, 
a great question, Ben. <laughs> Thank you for making this Customer Appreciation Week. Um, I, I, uh, I have a, a philosophy that has gotten me in a lot of trouble. Um, so I'll share that philosophy. Mm -hmm. I actually believe that the employee is more important than the customer. I know. <laughs> I, I heard you all make that face. That doesn't mean I don't love my customers. But I love my employees more. Because ultimately, they live and they breathe and they die and they sweat for the business. And yes, if an employee makes a mistake, we need to reprimand that situation, deal with it, make apologies. Uh, but if the customer is harassing my employee or abusing my employee or taking advantage of the business, I'm not going to tolerate it. It's not like I'm going to let my team member get, you know, run all over the street so that I could tell the customer they're number one. However, here's the real philosophy behind it. If you love your employees, and I mean really love, and you give them the tools and the resources to be successful, and you empower them to the best of your ability to be dynamic with the customer, then the customer, by definition, the customer experience will be better. If you suppress your team members and they don't feel appreciated and morale is bad and they feel like garbage, no matter how wonderful you have as a, as a customer philosophy, the customer experience is going to be poor. That is the only reason that I rank the employee above the customer. Not because the customer doesn't matter, but because if I take care of the employees, they'll help me take care of the customers. And yeah, there's going to be employees that don't do that. And then they're not going to be employees anymore. They're going to be working from home. That's the reality of it, right? But we never want our employees to feel like they're going to be less important than the dollar. They know when they mess up, and sometimes they have to do the apologizing. Question from the audience? Yes, ma'am. So I'm with Soiree, and you tried our desserts. And my question is, how do you locate a vendor or a manufacturer that can help you build something so that you can ship your, for me, little mini cupcakes um, without ending up wasting tens of thousands of dollars trying to manufacture something that's specific to my need. Did you waste tens of thousands of dollars? No, my husband would never let me. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> so your husband's in charge? Money, yeah. You're not the boss of your own business? Uh, I'm the boss to come here to see you. OK. Uh, I'm the boss on paper. But from a money perspective, he's the 51%. Oh, ah, yeah. so interesting. Well, either one of us have to. Well, first of all, you need to go home and have that changed, <laughs> right? It needs to be. We need to. We need to flip okay. that. Um, but look, the the before you start talking about finding manufacturers to make your product, you have to prove out the thesis that making the product and shipping it somewhere after the packaging, the shipping, all the costs that go into it are actually profitable. Shipping food around the country. Is that like a New York City siren? Uh, shipping food around the country typically isn't the most profitable venture in the world. You have your seasonality. You have your, your summer months where things melt very quickly. I mean. It's, it's not a green screen. We're really. Man, it is. This is like NYPD blue. Um, so before you go finding a manufacturer to solve that problem, I want to see you actually map out on paper how much revenue you would do what you would retail it for, because most people are going to want you to absorb a lot of the shipping expense, including the very special packaging that it would take to ship, what is your product? Little mini cupcakes, Little mini cupcakes across the country. Yeah. Um, and the ice and the dry ice and all the regulations and how all that's going to work. And then once you prove out that it's actually profitable, then you would go back and find the manufacturer. I think you're going to find it's very tough to ship food, very tough. I do it in a, a key lime pie business, and the margins um, when we do it in store are 50%, and the margins when we ship are 20%. It's just tough. And if you don't have a lot of volume, it's, you're not going to make much money. We don't make much money at 20% with a lot of volume. So you just want to make sure that you, you're putting the money in the right place. So I'm glad your husband didn't let you do it, but you're still in charge, right? <laughs> Let's take another uh, Facebook. Yeah, so Noel has a really good question. 
As a small business owner with basic financial understanding, where should she go to gra gain greater knowledge on this topic? Well, what's the topic she wants to grade not? Financial understanding. So there is this amazing uh, machine called the Google machine. Um, and I, we laugh about it. But if you think about it, when most of us were educated, we literally had a textbook, right, that we would get at school, and we would put it in our backpack, and we had to learn basic things there. If we didn't do well, we would get a tutor. If we didn't, the tutor didn't work out, our mothers would park us in the library for a week. That was the way we learned. In today's day and age, whether you are a child or whether you're an adult, the internet is a very powerful place and, more importantly, a very private place to learn. I think a lot of us are slightly embarrassed to admit that we don't know certain definitions. We don't know the difference between a debit and a credit. It's counterintuitive. We don't know what a balance sheet is. We don't know how to manage our cash flow. We don't even know what that means. Rather than being embarrassed about it, and if you're uncomfortable raising your hand, you can go on to the internet and literally type in, please explain what a balance sheet is. There are a number of courses, and every day that you have a question, either ask somebody and be comfortable with not knowing the answer, or write it down in a piece of paper, and at night, go study it. Be good once a day to go online and find some financial term that you don't know um, that will help you. And the internet really gives you that ability to do that. If you want to take it a step further, there are uh, online courses that you can take. Um, even on your phone, you can literally go onto your phone or your tablet um, and take a lot of different classes. For the, so those of you that commute by train or ride the bus or, or um, have a job that gives you some breaks, what a great chance to learn. And then once in a while while you're at a party, a very boring party like I would go to, you could bust out some of your knowledge, right? Like, did you know what a balance sheet was? Let me explain it to you. <laughs> Questions from the audience? Yes, ma'am. This is the most quiet New York City <laughs> Times Square crowd I've ever heard. Is this the kind of noise you make? Can you let the people around the country know you're alive? OK. My name is Gloria Paco, and I have a beauty and wellness app called Verdera. And one of the things we're coming across now is rev share. So getting into the market, getting brand awareness, and balancing you know, our marketing spend. Do you have any feedback on good balances for rev share with the new business into market? And is it something that we should be uh, putting a lot of pressure on now or get spending more on the back end and being able to get more marketing for a lower price? So for the audience's sake, I had a chance to meet you earlier. Your app connects beauty providers with consumers, much like Angie's List was creating, connecting consumers with plumbers and electricians, right? So facials, haircuts, massages, all those things, right? So ultimately, if you're trying to grow your business, when you say RevShare, I think white label, meaning that you would take your infrastructure and give a, another brand who may be in the space the opportunity to show their consumers that they offer these services? So it, it would more so be, for example, like a Groupon or a Gilt, where they offer your services at a, um, you kind of break off the retail price at slightly a discount, but they don't charge you up front, it's on the back end um, after the sales go through. I, I um, uh, have not had, personally have any luck with Groupon mm -hmm. in any business that I've ever been involved with. I've had, ha have had some luck with Gilt. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to be careful how I answer this. I don't like the idea of you selling your product short to give somebody else a fee mm -hmm. before that revenue even comes in. Well, it's more so it's all back in. So it's all after the sales actually go through. So it's after you've recognized your profit and your margin and you've built that in as a cost of goods. Yes, exactly. So I'm, I'm definitely in favor of any rev share model that is variable. And what I mean by that is it's built in as a line item in your cost of goods, not an upfront fee where somebody's selling you some golden dream that all these customers are going to come. Mm -hmm. For me, I would rather give up more money in the long run through a rev share program than a check today for a hope to have. So there are a lot of companies that love rev share models. I'm a fan of them as long as it's variable. Meaning if I don't sell anything, 
you don't get anything. That makes sense. And I have a second part to the question. Yes. So the other part is in terms of discounting and bringing consumers to you, there's always the balance of how much of a discount do you get to get them without them falling off and repeating with you. Do you have any advice on that as well? I think in order for a consumer to become sticky, the offer has to be attractive enough but not so attractive that you become a commodity for them and they just you know, are in and out. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, discounting for new products are a source of building your database, right? And you have to look at that as a cost of acquisition. So no matter what business you're in, whether you're in the wholesale business, whether you're in the services business, as you discount services, you're looking to bring somebody into the tent and then retain them. So the type of offer that you give them matters. <clears throat> For example, if you give somebody something free, their likelihood of converting to a paid performer later is dramatically reduced because they have nothing at stake. If you give somebody a buy one, get one, or you give somebody a bounce back offer, what you're trying to do is essentially get them to come back later and spend later. So be very careful at understanding what your cost of acquisition is using any form of marketing and what it is in different forms. So for you, if you're running your app, you may do a little bit of radio as an example, a little bit of paid search, a little bit of Facebook advertising. You want to be able to track those different mediums, see which one has the lowest cost with the highest return, dig more into those, and really understand where that discount threshold is. To me, again, too much discount isn't always a good thing. They may never come back. Thank you. Yep. Yes, sir. Marcus, we talked a little bit um, earlier. I'm a technologist. Um, on a personal level, I know you're busy. How do you manage your time with all your businesses, all your shows, with all your employees and staff? Yep. How do you prioritize all those things? Um, yeah, you know, personal I, life, because I know you, know, yeah, you no, have family. Answer, I'll answer you honestly. I'll answer you honestly. If you're going to be a business owner, you have to accept the fact that your life is going to be very different. And business owners have literally everything at stake. You have everything at stake, right? And it's, it's tough. If you choose to be a business owner, it is a very different world. You make sacrifices. And you miss out on certain things. And I think you have to really be comfortable with that. If you're not comfortable having a different life, and giving 100% of your time, unfortunately, to all of those people, then it may not be the thing for you. For me, I made the choice years ago to, that that was going to be my purpose. I was going to commit myself to really being invested in people. It, it's a tough balance for me because I give up other things. And that's not something that's a bad thing. I don't, I'm not looking for any pity over it. But I think people need to understand that I'm not a huge believer and I need to work on it. I'm not a huge believer that as a business owner, you can perfect the work-life balance. I just don't know how it's possible. Because at 3 in the morning, when you get a call that your building's burning down, or that a job went bad, or an employee, there's an employee issue, it just happens. When you can't make payroll on Friday, on Thursday night, you're not out at the movies. You're just not. But your employees are. And um, I think that's just the, the choice you have to make. If you, are, um, it's just, if you become a professional athlete, you live a certain lifestyle. If you become a priest, you live a certain lifestyle. If you become a small business owner, you live a certain lifestyle. So I don't have the answer for like, I don't have a secret. It's, it's tough, really tough. Social media? Yeah. Uh, so Dylan wants to know, what is the best method or tool for small businesses to use for networking? What is the best method or tool for uh, businesses to use for, for networking? You know, there are a lot of, in your community, whatever town you live in, there are a lot of support groups. Uh, there are a lot of best practice groups. There are a lot of industry groups. Whether it's trade shows or chamber of commerces. And we have a gentleman here from the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. There he is right there. Um, there are a lot of uh, uh, groups that can help provide that support. Um, it sometimes has a small fee to it, and you can't look at that as an expense. You're unlocking the door to meeting new people and sharing your 
problems and learning about other people's problems. So my, my advocacy is to join a group or an organization where you can you know, riff back and forth. In the room? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Ishveen from Open Sponsorship. We run a marketplace that connects businesses with professional athletes for marketing purposes, and I know marketing isn't um, something that you're a massive advocate for, but what's not? What am I not an advocate for? Marketing. Marketing? Yeah. I love marketing. Okay, maybe because before you were like. No, no, no. I was just saying okay. that I, I, I love marketing, but I don't think that a small business can win against a big business by out marketing them. Yeah. So um, we work a lot with small businesses to leverage like local NFL athletes, um, one-off deals, super cheap, high impact. What is your advice to someone like us or other marketing people who are selling to small businesses? What's the good thing to focus on when obviously budget is a massive concern, but you want to show them that brand awareness and like driving excitement is important? Well, you and I may not agree on this. I really want small businesses to focus all of their marketing on calls to action in the early stages of things. I think branding is important, but I think there's creative ways to do it. I would rather take those branding dollars and drive in-store activation or in-service activation. I like things that are going to get people to raise their hand and buy the service or buy the product or engage with my company. So my form of marketing, I still like good old-fashioned direct mail. Believe it or not, that's me, because it does bring a call to action. I like really active social media that involves behind-the-scenes looks into the business. So if you own whatever it may be, uh, you own a party planning business, I would take little video clips with permission from the party thrower uh, and showing people how it works. If you own a giant cell company, I would take people in the back to meet Ivan, the manager. Ivan, Hi. say hello. Because ultimately, the people and what happens behind the scenes engages people and brings them closer to your business. Do you not think there's a higher chance of someone paying attention to your direct mail flyer if there's a remotely famous, let's say, um, NBA player on the front? Potentially. I mean, I think it really depends on the product. I think the product or service that you're offering and the endorsement that you're connecting them to have to be relevant. Here's a good example. If I owned a local um, physical therapy or, or rehab center, then yes, having a professional athlete would make sense to me. If I owned a cigar bar, then maybe having a professional athlete would make sense to me. If I owned a flower shop, maybe not so much. So it would really matter to me what the business was and how I was going to bring that recognizable image. There's a plus and minus to, in my mind, to bringing celebrity endorsements into products. One, that person has to add value to the business and has to really use the product, be familiar with it, be engaged in it. And people have to really see that. Two, it has to be obvious to the consumer why there's a connection. Typically, what I see a lot is professional athletes and automobile dealerships. Is that a common? Common one? It's, it's, to me, that doesn't make me want to buy the car there. What makes me want to buy the car is, am I getting a good monthly payment? Am I getting a good deal? The, the endorsement may separate me from everybody else, but it doesn't give me the ability, it doesn't um, take away my requirement to do the basic fundamentals. So I could see endorsements as a top layer on the cake after the meat of the cake is ripe. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, I think I can speak well, you know? Mm -hmm. People. The, the, we need the webcast says, people. But we need everybody yeah. in the world to hear yeah. you. You're a handsome dude. By the way, right. real quickly, just because I'm fascinated by what you do, tell everybody about your business. I'm a restaurant owner um, from the country called Guyana, beautiful Guyana, it's in the, uh, South America. But it's a Caribbean uh, country. Um, I'm looking to expand my restaurant here in Brooklyn. How much soup this do you year. sell in one hour? Oh, we sell, uh, we sell tons of that stuff, maybe 200, 300, 1,000 customers per day. It's, we do better than the average Starbucks here in the U.S. in Guyana, so now we're looking to expand. Okay. All right. So um, you were going to ask me something. I apologize. Yeah, the question I want to ask you is your three Ps, and uh, for those who don't know, and, and I hope I get it right, people, process, and product. You got it. All right. Um, from your experience, 
which of the three do you see small businesses neglecting or falling short on the most? People. People? I do. Uh, and, there's a, and there's a very... Um, there's a very fine line that I'll walk on this. In every small business, it usually starts out literally with just you, right? It starts out with just you. And you're struggling to um, be the accountant, the marketing person, provide the service. And then we start to bring people in. And we look for the cheapest people we can find. You know that term? I just saw you look at him. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Come up here, ma'am. Come up here, please. That's right. Are you guilty of that? No, not me, but... But who, him? Yes. <laughs> you look for the cheapest, quote, unquote, cheapest people we can find. No, don't, you're not going anywhere. No, no business should ever use the word cheapest regarding anything. No business should say, I need to find somebody that's unemployed because I know they need a job and they'll take anything I'll give them. What you should do is understand what your business needs, right? And go out and find the person who you think best fits that bill. If cash compensation is limited, then that, that potential employee is going to have to make that decision. You may have to use other tools in your toolbox to attract that person to your new business. And sometimes it means you're going to give up a little bit of the cheddar. You're going to give up some of the equity. People have this really hard, difficult time in this idea of partners, whether they work there or whether they invest there. In my opinion, a partner is one of the quintessential keys to success in small business, not just because of the financial resources they bring to the table, but because of the other resources they bring to the table. Experience, connections, mentorship, structure and discipline, feeling accountable to somebody else. Our level of performance is always better when there's a, a, a monitor, a teacher, a, a disciplinarian nearby. I'm not asking you to think about a partner as the disciplinarian, but we know that if we're even mildly accountable to somebody else, we're going to operate at a higher level. And two heads are better than one. So people, whether it's an employee or a potential partner, Small businesses sometimes neglect them. They use things like this. I can't afford them. That may be true. I want to be my own boss. I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I want to control all the areas. I don't want anybody else controlling that. And then we make the mistake of hiring people and then doing their job for them or not letting them do their job. And then we wonder why they leave. So I think as small business owners, we have to just invest a little bit more in our people with the understanding that the financial resources. What is his name? Rodney. Rodney, is that your, is that your man? No, it's my supervisor. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up, Rodney. How you doing, sir? Uh, no, you stand over here with her. Um, well, um, I, I do, but she's going to smack you. Um, <laughs> So what is it that you guys do? Uh, we work for a nonprofit organization in the Bronx. We do home care and we do social services. We're a nonprofit. Yeah, I'm the chief financial officer and she's the senior yeah, accountant. Uh -huh. And one of the things, I mean, I've been watching your shows for a number of years and I like your people practicing properly. But she doesn't like your pay. She, she, she's part of it. <laughs> the, the issue that we're mainly faced with is changing culture, how do you get everyone else to buy into the culture or the things that you see? I mean, one of the things we just started to do, and I must give Janet props for that, is we just started in order to bring the staff together more on a monthly basis. We'll be doing a monthly luncheon, and for the last two months, me and her have been doing the cooking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a chef, by the way, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we've been doing the cooking for the stuff, and How's we decided that we are going to do it. His food is good? We okay. decided that we are going to do it on a monthly basis. Well, first of all, I want to uh, compliment you on working in nonprofit. So first of all, let's give them a round of applause. Because your, your financial resources are different than a for-profit business. 
and employees and recipients of your service don't always understand that. And you're trying to, being the CFO of a nonprofit has to be a tough job, right? And so you appreciate that. So don't be making faces at him anymore. <laughs> Second of all, just as a side note, um, for those of you that own small businesses, I would constantly encourage you to uh, really engage with public servants, military, both active and retired, uh, firefighters, police officers, school teachers, and really bring them into your business by offering them a special arrangement, a special price, a special service, not because you're trying to just attract business, but because it's hard enough in today's day and age, and big businesses love to say they do it, but I think small businesses can prove that we do do it. Um, and so we want to focus on those two things. So thank you for your nonprofit. And if anybody here, anybody here, uh, retired military or active military, thank you for your service. Appreciate that. Yeah. So do, let's do one more from the live stream. I was told to stop, but yeah. since you're in charge now, we'll take one more. Okay, one more. So this one is more. from Bruno, all the way from Brazil. Bruno from Brazil. Yeah, he, wants to, he wants to know about scaling his business. Um, so a business that's small and profitable, when, when should they scale? Should they scale? OK. So we touched on this a little earlier, and my, my response will be exactly the same. If you own a business today that is profitable, don't be in a hurry to scale it. Right? I don't know what the rush is, because Sometimes more isn't better. You look at all these malls and all these storefronts empty because they wanted to have a 1,000 stores, or they wanted to have a 1,000 people working for them, or they saw themselves taking over. I'm going to take over the world. You know what? Just run your business, make a good living, provide for your family, pay your bills on time, grow your company. And if you do those things right, it will grow on its own. If you're really providing a service or a product that people want, they will find you. And if nobody else is solving the problem, then you'll go find it. But I think for now, we'll, we'll, we'll keep it slow. Um, thank you very much for joining me. By the way, please tune in every Wednesday to Whiteboard Wednesdays. We're going to be giving tips. And then over the next several months, we're going to do live engagements, live Q&As. Um, I want to thank T-Mobile at work. Um, and this is a very important thing for me to tell you. I um, have very few relationships with, with companies. And the only ones that I ever get involved with are ones who dedicate real financial resources towards small business. And, business, and companies that understand uh, my goal and other people who work for small business and their goals. It's the backbone of this country. Um, and uh, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you and for people like T-Mobile. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Mike.